Hi, good evening everyone um, and welcome to uh, the second part of our day, um, Immersion Technologies and Design Master's Postgraduate Program uh, keynote lecture. Um, as you might know, MTech is a MSc and MRC mixed program and uh, we employ a scientific approach to architecture and design and uh, if you had a chance this afternoon you saw our uh, thesis dissertation projects from our phase two students and this evening we're very happy to be joined by Andy Watts. And uh, just gonna have, well, I mean, there's no need to introduce Andy, but Andy is the <laughs> director of uh, design technology in Grimshaw. Uh, for those of you who have joined us online and for here, we welcome you to our keynote lecture this year. Thank you. Andy, the floor is yours. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, Okay, so, I mean, first of all, thank you, Elif, Michael, and Milad for inviting me um, to give this lecture this evening. It's a privilege to be here, and thank you to you all for attending as well. Um, the focus of this talk, um, I say talk, it, it's a bit of an overview of what we do at Grimshaw through the context of how technology can be used to really provide a level of openness to the construction industry. So it's a bit of... Um, a show and tell, a bit of a project overview, and also potentially a little bit of a rant about how we should be more open, I would say. Um, so a bit of a background to me, as um, the guys introduced, I'm Andy Watts, I head up the design technology team at Grimshaw. Um, and as a bit of a background, because it's kind of pertinent to this, uh, to this conversation actually, um, design technology is a bit of a misnomer in the profession, so you know, I wanted to give a bit on my background. I am an architect, um, start on a more traditional path with absolutely no technology leaning whatsoever. And then things went a little bit pear-shaped after part two, um, ventured into facade design, working with the likes of Zaha, um, Snow Hetta, Salon, um, and through that developed this kind of leaning towards computational design. And that is really from that point that I kind of described my career as some kind of accidental um, trajectory. Um, I intended to go back into architecture after facades, but then got drawn into this technology side of things at Grimshaw. Um, so continuing on this, this theme of setting the scene, um, for those of you who don't know Grimshaw, um, we are a global architectural practice founded in 1980 by Sir Nicholas Grimshaw. Um, that's him on the left with the fantastic hair and moustache with uh, Buckminster Fuller. Um, and since then, you know, we've, we've then grown into this global organization, still focused primarily on architecture. Uh, we're not multidisciplinary, we just do the architectural design, but with studios around the world, um, London, New York, Melbourne, and Sydney, are where we're primarily based, but then we have emerging practices in LA, in Paris, Dubai, Auckland, and coming soon in China as well. Um, and we have been kind of undergoing this kind of very strong period of growth, um, you know, post, before COVID and post COVID, um, and actually we're looking strong into the next few years as well. But in terms of, you know, again, setting the background to, to our team, the portfolio of work that we have at Grimshaw, we don't have necessarily an aesthetic, a particular visual style, rather, you know, the, the thematic that runs through our portfolio is one of scale, of complexity and of detail. Um, you know, they're kind of the three hallmarks that you'll find on the majority of our projects. And it's really that scale and complexity that actually necessitates a really strong um, approach to technology, which is where my team comes into play. Um, this team of design technology where I'm very privileged to um, you know, work with a crazy talented team of specialists across disciplines, including BIM, computational design, extended reality, urban computation, in-house tool development, DFMA, environmental performance, quite the range of different digital sins that you can think of. Um, but the one you know, very key approach that we've taken when it comes to how we are set up as a team is that we've taken this kind of silo-less approach. So we don't want to have a Grimshaw BIM team that don't speak to a Grimshaw computation team, but rather we want to encourage each of these disciplines to be speaking to each other, to be cross-pollinating ideas, and to be collaborating as much as possible. So that theme of openness coming through there. Um, 
And, you know, as Grimshaw is a global organization, we are a global team as well. So, you know, we're very well established in the UK and the US. We're growing in Australia at the moment and will do over the next year or two. Um, but again, you know, this really starts to um, really put an emphasis on this idea for collaboration and for that sharing of ideas. Um, so, you know, our design technology group has three core functions. On the one hand, as you would expect, is project enabling. It's working with um, our day-to-day -day project teams, you know, uncovering their, their pains in terms of what they're doing, helping them through those, and working to deliver the aspirations that our design teams have. Um, we do a lot of research as well, working into emerging themes and technologies, both that are emerging within the practice, but also emerging you know, across the industry and even beyond the, the realms of our industry as well. Um, and then sitting you know, comfortably in between that is applied innovation, you know, looking for those opportunities to take our research and development work and then um, apply it on everyday projects as and when possible. Um, and so, you know, that's a bit of background to my team, the design technology team. And it's all, you know, based on this ethos that Grimshaw, it's not a technology-led practice, it's a design-led practice, but it's enabled by technology. Um, we've always wanted to make that distinction. Um, but it's really, you know, in this statement that, you know, we start to pull out those words of design and technology, and that's what we are focusing on in this talk today. Um, so, you know, as we all know, the dynamic between technology and design has shifted and will continue to shift over the years. Um, you know, where technology was once seen by some as kind of at odds with the process of design, mm -hmm. it's now becoming more and more relevant and necessary to architectural teams. And it's worth noting that as part of this, when I say technology, I'm talking digital technology. Um, and so, you know, with that said, the evolution of that relationship has not always been seamless. Adoption is still an issue. I, um, I challenge you to name a practice where every member of the um, design team has embraced digital technologies. Um, but that's just at an organizational level. You know, at an industry level, you know, we have a field with different players um, in various stages of their own different transformations as businesses, quite often trying to tackle the same challenges in the same ways, but in these disparate silos of activity. Um, these challenges of adoption, integration, and collaboration, you know, they can be tackled through open dialogue, you know, this idea of openness, that you know, we seek to enable change and work with, the, frankly, the transformative qualities of technology. Um, but it's not just the flip of a switch. Um, I mean, again, setting the context for the industry at the moment, um, as I'm sure everybody is aware, the nature of business is placing you know, more, much more focus on the need to produce you know, higher quality work in a shorter amount of time and at less cost, you know, all those challenges. Um, and this is in an industry where we struggle to get people to move from uh, traditional 2D drafting to 3D data-enabled design. Um, and then you throw into that, you know, where we as a society are seeing huge amounts of focus placed you know, around the sustainability agenda, the need to minimize and, and try and reverse our footprint as much as possible. And then you know, much closer to home, actually you know, the emphasis and scrutiny that is being placed on the construction industry um, to you know, work by the book, deliver safe, high quality designs and try and minimize tragedies or try and reduce and get rid of any tragedies as we saw at Grenfell. So, you know, all of that serves to really kind of set, let's say, the exam question of how can we leverage technology to better enable um, architectural design. Um, and so for practices like Grimshaw, you know, it, it really kind of demands this focus to enable designs to use technology more readily. Um, and then for the wider industry, you know, progressing existing tools or leading on new solutions, you know, we need to take a much more open and collaborative approach as much as possible. And so it's really these two points that I'd like to focus on today. Um, and, you know, I'll be illustrating it with some of the work that we've been doing at Grimshaw as part of our work with design technology, but also part of the dialogue that we've been lucky um, to be part of across the wider industry as well. Um, and so, 
you know, taking this first one in mind, this idea of embedding technology in practice, it is a necessity which, you know, it can be actioned, it can be accelerated by unlocking, I'd say, four key aspects of open dialogue. One is accessibility, then mobility, language, and finally, exploration. So, you know, let's break down those um, on a case-by-case -case basis. So, accessibility. This idea that d designers, you know, for them to really engage and leverage technology, access is critical. An opportunity for, you know, hands-on experimentation to really get their hands dirty when it comes to technology. This idea of learning through doing. And this is, it's fundamental. You lock technology away, nobody's going to use it. Um, so Grimshaw, you know, we've enabled that through promoting uh, technology expertise directly into um, our design and project teams. As I mentioned at the beginning, that idea of project enabling and um, applied innovation. And it's this idea that we need to, you know, permeate design solutions as opposed to siloing teams that are then pulled in at particular stages. We want to be, we want technology teams to be embedded from the very beginning and all the way through. Um, so that integrated approach, you know, we feed it through a centralized design technology team composed of specialists in BIM, CD, XR, Urban, um, who all work together to test and deliver the best solutions on projects as much as possible. And so we have collaborative design technology and we have collaborative design teams as well. Um, and then, you know, as well as embedding specialist expertise into projects, we also need to improve accessibility through visibility, through sharing knowledge as much as possible. That can be internal trainings, knowledge sharing, specialist talks, CPDs, invited lectures, um, and then building out repositories of information as well. But taking that a step further, you know, we really need to start actually pushing these tools into the hands of our design teams as much as possible. Um, so that can be, you know, through demonstrations, through workshops, through internal live demos. Um, because actually, once the designer has had a go, that then breaks down a barrier of hesitancy or nervousness that might surround anything new at all. Um, and so, you know, these are examples, of particularly around our work with extended reality, of, you know, as and when something is produced um, or experimented with, we'll just give it to the design teams, even if it's not finished, even if it's, uh, you know, is still fairly rudimentary. As soon as we can get feedback, as soon as we can start people engaged with it, that's when they get really excited. Um, so then, moving on a bit. Uh, so mobility, as te technology is inherently um, becoming much more accessible in society, you know, that knowledge then needs to um, constantly transfer as well. So. We make technology more accessible within the industry. We need to make sure that our projects and teams are able to move around as necessary. Um, so, as we said, you know, um, technology inherently creates more mobile working processes. However, the next step is mobili mobility in execution, leveraging different expertise at the most ex effective time for a project. So, as I mentioned at the beginning, you know, Grimshaw, we are a global organization. But that also means we're able to draw on expertise from across an international portfolio, import and export expertise as we see fit. Um, but then we really start to amplify that as, you know, as we start to blend and move technology expertise around, you know, as we mentioned, um, this idea that we have this siloless approach. Our work on urban computation, for instance, that example that's on screen, it brings together urban design expertise, computational design expertise, applications development, data management, um, to create this suite of tools that actually any designer within the practice can now use and draw upon as, as they see fit. Um, because they're developed without a particular project in mind, these aren't just you know, one solution, rather they're intended to be you know, project agnostic, geographically agnostic, and allow every project to benefit from efficiencies, so mobility of um, tools as well. Um, and, you know, elsewhere, we've, we kind of leverage that technology beyond the borders of our own team, um, you know, mobilizing, for instance, with our sustainability team. And this is where it's become really vital because, you know, as I mentioned at the beginning, sustainability has become mission critical to a huge swathe of the AEC industry, very much including Grimshaw within that. So we need to make fast and far-reaching decisions. Um, and so this was a tool that was developed where we can very quickly... Uh, monitor the progress of each project against the UN SDGs or Sustainable Development Goals. 
Um, and so it's bringing, you know, very isolated, you know, quite, I'd say quite niche knowledge, but also then making it um, accessible and mobile. Um, and I'll come on to, in a moment, a case study of where we've actually brought to bear all of the different um, design technology capabilities that we have. Um, because this is where I really want to kind of, you know, hammer home this idea of, of making the expertise mobile. Um, we were able to draw on our work on the um, Terra, which is the Sustainability Pavilion at the Dubai 2020 Expo, by actually bringing together expertise from across um, the, from both within Grimshaw, but also outside of Grimshaw, from across the globe to actually help us deliver this. So, you know, ranging from um, technical, technical expertise and a high level of detailing and, and um, DFMA approaches right through to then digitizing those, pushing those into a computational environment so that we can then, you know, see the impacts of any different design decision that is made, any tweak that is made in a model, we start to understand it. We can then, you know, very quickly document it through more traditional BIM processes, um, which then becomes the same model that we can use as part of our visualization processes um, so that we can then communicate these ideas as, as much as possible. And then rather than relying solely on 2D information, we're then able to run stakeholder engagement with clients, with um, future potential users, leveraging uh, XR capabilities. So we're able to then explore a design in VR. Now, this was six years ago, so you know it's still the early days of VR, but it was an incredibly valuable tool. Um, and that, that theme of, of using emerging immersive technologies then carried on through to some of the work that we were looking at on site. So this is on top of that huge central canopy where we were actually able to use Microsoft HoloLens and overlay um, the Rhino model on top of the canopy. Now, I'm gonna caveat this by saying, in that video, it looks like it's not aligned. That's the headset, that's not, it was aligned. So it's all good. Um, but through that, we were able to actually deliver this you know, pretty, frankly, crazy, but also phenomenal building. Um, by really starting to mobilize a full swathe of different design technology expertise. Um, so as a comparison, you know, in terms of the benefits that that can bring, that central canopy essentially needed one and a half full-time equivalent or people on it, as opposed to the remaining more traditional buildings, which were delivered in a slightly more traditional way, where we had a team of 15 working on each of those, and they're slightly less complex. So it's this idea that having a, um, a very agile approach to technology from the beginning can really enable some quite amazing pieces of work. Um, moving on then, so language or communication, um, you know, I think many of us recognize that technology comes with this language baggage, you know, specialist language and terms um, that can create these barriers to open engagement. Um, and we know that however, the, the outcome wanted by technology and design teams is the same, so we need to do, really start to develop a common language of recognition. And it's at this point that I need to apologize to um, some of the teams that uh, presented today, um, because they actually helped me do this next slide. Um, so, you know, if we really dive in at the deep end, you know, specialists have this ability to really kind of, frankly, I would say bewilder with well-meaning jargon and buzzwords, but they start to lose or alienate an audience. Um, and, you know, I, I, this is meant as a, a, bit, a bit of a um, in jest, but actually, you know, it, even if we zoom out to a higher level, you know, I said at the beginning, as a technology team, we have capabilities in BIM, in computational design, in extended reality, urban computation, app development, you know, these words that, you know, to me, in my day-to-day -day work, these are commonplace, I know what these are. But actually, when it comes to project teams, in terms of what they need, um, you know, those, those previous words are less important, whereas actually they want to know how to carry out design ideation, how to look at the performance of a design, how to deliver and document, how to engage with stakeholders, how to add value. These are the words that they're interested in, these are the words that they understand. Um, 
And quite simply, we need to translate. That's what this comes down to. You know, it's this um, idea of bringing together the what and the why. Um, design technology teams know what's possible. A design, team's, a design team knows why they need the technology. And then, you know, taking that forward, how it will then enable and augment a project. So in that case, you know, we, we move from a, a technical and a program-based language, you know, BIM, CD, X, XR, to an impact and outcome-based lexicon, you know, such as ideation, performance, engagement. And in doing so, you know, we really start to see the benefits that an unsiloed approach to technology, you know, can bring by allowing open dialogue and cross-pollination of expertise to deliver everything that the design team is wanting. You know, we start to see design technology as a, as a term, as an overarching function that can really, you know, enable project work as much as possible. Um, and then as an added point, you know, that idea of language doesn't have to just be at a conversational or dialogue-based level, but also through how we produce and store our work in a way that is digestible to everybody, not just specialists. Um, and finally, in terms of like the internal um, enabling of technology is exploration. Um, it's this idea of constantly pushing against the borders of what technologies can offer. Um, through exploration. So whether that's just through reading around a subject or actively developing tools or solutions that can serve to fill, you know, gaps in your tool set. Um, but, you know, for us, its examples include, you know, applications for stakeholder engagement, allowing our clients to remotely access and um, explore design options, you know, the, the point on the left, or developing, you know, very rudimentary analysis procedures that, you know, feather in well with our existing tools. Um, to allow analysis on the fly, to inform iterative design processes, or to just, um, you know, give an idea of actually whether we're heading in the right direction or not. Um, or it can actually be through engaging with new themes um, that are emerging within uh, both the industry and society. So the case in point here is our a recent piece of work we did on the metaverse, which... Um, as an anecdote, we got this commission the day after I did an interview with the Reba Journal saying Grimshaw will never touch the metaverse. And then one of the directors came up to me and said, by the way, we've got this. Um, but actually, you know, in seeing that, it, it, was, it was actually a very fun opportunity to explore this, this new technology, which is, is very much in its infancy. It's very much, um, you know, we're still trying to figure out what we can achieve with it and how a wider society is going to engage with it. But for us, it was an opportunity to further develop skill sets, but also actually, you know, be part of a change and ho hopefully try and influence that change as it starts to instantiate within, um, well, both industry and society, I would say. Um, so, you know, th those were how, how we can start to look at um, being more open when it comes to technology in-house. Now, what about, you know, beyond... And, and in the wider industry. So, you know, with a practice that is, you know, conversant in embracing and, and enabling technology, there needs to be a landscape within the industry that likewise delivers on that opportunity for, to be more open and collaborative. Um, there are barriers to that. Um, you know, in the context of this talk, I'll point out two. One is that the, ind the construction industry is historically notoriously slow when it comes to digital transformation. Um, I'm sure there are people in the audience who've seen um, any kind of industry talk about this who will know the exact McKinsey slide that shows how far down the table the construction industry is. I think second only to agriculture, and I think actually agriculture may have overtaken us by this point. Um, and second is, as I mentioned at the beginning, that pressure on fees, on scope. Um, we are an incredibly competitive industry with firms extremely protective over IP. So how do we, you know, get past that towards actually having a much more collaborative approach as a wider industry? You know, the former of those is well established but needs to be tackled. The latter is really where we can begin to instantiate a change um, on a practice basis, I would say. Um, so collaboration. Um, when it comes to our product, our design, our commercial offer, then it's totally understood that we as as a practice are going to be competitive and we should. That's how we remain um, in business, by competing with each other for better design and better outcomes. It's how we get the best possible. 
however, when it comes to our tool set, i.e. the technologies that we're using, my feeling is that there are opportunities for us to collaborate as an industry through a much more open dialogue and in this idea of collaboration. Um, why would we do this? The AEC industry is rife with inefficiency as, frankly, the majority of firms are tackling the same problems with the same technology and reinventing the same wheels again and again. Um, so how can we move forward with this? So, you know, first of all, there's collaborating through specific networks or partners. Uh, for Grimshaw, we've got this, we've got, I mean, this is the tip of the iceberg, but we've got a very broad range of partners across the spectrum, including academia, with the MTech, um, with industry, with government bodies, with software um, providers, and also with pro bono organizations as well. Um, and, you know, this, it serves to aid experimentation. It's worthwhile putting this slide in here that there is, you know, some amazing work being done here where we've afforded the opportunity to push forward um, with agendas that we don't necessarily that we can't necessarily experiment as freely with in, in practice, but you know, through collaboration, particularly with academia and other industry partners, we really you know, get this opportunity to really stretch our legs when it comes to our thinking. Um, but I'm sure when thinking back to this idea of collaboration, when I'd say that, the, the mind will probably go to open source. And this is, I, I would say, where the, I'd say the slightly ranty part of this uh, conversation comes into play. Um, open source is, is brilliant, and if we look at the definition of open source, um, it, this really, you know, it, it starts to come about through software. This is it's where the, the term origin, originated, and this is the definition of open source software development. It's made by many people, distributed under essentially an open license, which grants all rights to use, study, change, and share the software. Now, People, will, people and companies will often say that they are working in an open source way. And for me, the hallmarks of open source collaboration are peer production, so everybody working on the same thing, open access, so making it as open as possible, willingness to share, and then a really transparent approach to collaboration as well. And frankly, I would say this, on this definition is where we fall down a little bit, and I'll come on to that in a moment. Um, so we take a simple task. Rhino to Revit. Every firm in the industry has had this issue at some point. And over the years, many tools have been invented, whether internally in a practice or as external products to, to tackle this. And here we've just got you know, a small sample of the tools available. But given the sheer amount of effort that has gone into resolving this problem in each of these tools, it's fascinating to think what could have been achieved if that effort had been consolidated. What else could have been achieved in the same amount of time? And this seems like a rel relatively, let's say, trivial example uh, when it's simply a matter of efficiency at risk. But now start to look at a crucial issue like sustainability, for instance, how we measure the whole life carbon of a design. And this is where uh, Luis Fraguada of um, McNeil actually made me, I will say, laugh out loud when he posted this because it resonates a lot. Um, as with interoperability, we're starting to see the same pattern emerge with firms creating their own approaches. You know, if we continue in this manner behind disparate closed doors, we will not make the meaningful progress that we need to in order to make the required impact in time. Um, and, as, and I say closed doors, but a lot of the work that is being done is being done under the label of open source. The only issue here is that it's being undermined because everybody is creating and open sourcing their own tools. They're not actually collaborating, they're just creating more silos. They're just allowing access to all these silos. Um, and for me, you know, open source should facilitate collaboration. It should encourage companies to work together on common goals. It's just not being used in the right way. Um, at which point, you know, we question why we bother open sourcing. Um, but I would say there is absolutely a need to do it. It's more a case of changing mindsets than actually moving away from, um, from the endeavor itself. And so coming on to you know, a, a project example of where we've also been trying to tackle this issue of open source and collaboration. Um, this is a program that we worked on called the Construction Innovation Hub. Um, 
which was aimed at bringing together a vertical cross-section of the UK construction industry to investigate and develop a platform approach to DFMA. Now, I've said a lot of words there. I'll come on to that in a moment. Um, but an un undermining, under undermining, underlying principle of this is to look at how open source approaches and digital standardization can enable a much more richer and intelligent sharing of ideas across the entire supply chain. Um, so it brought together collaborators, as I said, across a vertical cross-section from design, engineering, contractors, suppliers, manufacturers, as well as having government buy-in from six departments um, with this idea of actually, we've got a client, we've got an entire supply chain, surely we can make this work. Um, and for us in particular, we had a very strong um, collaboration with Bureau Happold as part of this work. Um, so again, a little bit of background to this. Um, this idea of DFMA or design for manufacturing assembly is something that's very much in the DNA of Grimshaw. Going back to the work on the Herman Miller factory in Bath in 1976, again, the fantastic mustaches on display there. Um, through more recently to our work on the crossrail architectural components. So um, we were responsible for all of the um, design language for all of the below ground work on, on the Elizabeth line. Um, and so the, the Construction Innovation Hub and the platform design program that we were part of really started to look at how we as an industry can define a methodology that looks at kits of parts, not just at a component level, but starting to look at sub-assemblies, assemblies, and then the building as a whole as well. And not just looking at the parts independently, but then starting to look at how those parts start to fit together, you know, how we can look at the interfaces between everything. So we've got a kit of parts in the first instance, and then a kit of, rule, kit of rules in the second part. But then after that, there's this idea of, you know, what is the digital intervention into this because if you've got you know a manual that says these are your parts these are your rules that's no good unless you can actually utilize them so again bringing in another buzzword within uh, the industry at, in, in fact society at the moment is around configurators um, this idea that you can take a predefined set of uh, rules and you know a predefined set of parts and configure them um, within a, a specific design space. Um, and this, you know, is where, again, we've started to see things happening within the wider industry, this idea of open sourced and closed source reinvention of the wheel. Um, this phenomenon of actually a wide range of different products and platforms being produced across the industry, which, don't get me wrong, they're fantastic pieces of work, but can you imagine if they all actually spoke to each other or if they all actually started to be, um, you know, either connected or teams started to work together? And so this this was, you know, a, a real precursor to some of our work on the Construction Innovation Hub is we took that and actually ran with it and said, what if we could define the language where all of these things could speak to one another? They could exchange data. They could actually start to um, pass information from one. So if Somebody like, like TestFit builds a product uh, around um, site feasibility and analysis, which could then be passed to Ramble's site solve to actually look at what the ability of putting a building on site, then passing it to Prism from Bryden Wood and actually saying, okay, now detail it out using a, a kit of parts. That would be incredibly fantastic, but at the moment we're not quite there. So we looked at a way where we could enable the tools developed by different parties and, in, in fact, the whole supply chain to start to speak to one another. So again, not just focusing on um, first principles, design, feasibility, and architecture, but then also looking down the supply chain, how those models, how that information can be passed to fabricators, contractors, to actually populate with their own work as well. Um, and so we did this... Um, open source piece of work, which is available if anybody wants to work on it and contribute to it, um, where we essentially defined a what we termed the common configurator framework, which wasn't focused on the outcome configurators themselves. I mean, as you can see, these are based in Rhino. They're fairly prototypical, but they were a 
proof of concept of being able to pass data from one configurator to another without loss of any information and with allowing every stakeholder to apply their own principles. And so this is one of you know, multiple promising initiatives we've got across the industry to bring about you know, closer collaboration, whether it's led from industry or through funded research, which is what the Construction Innovation Hub was. And so we've been incredibly fortunate to be part of some of those conversations. So, you know, moving beyond, and we're coming to the end now, moving beyond collaboration, um, there's then this idea of challenging. And this is, you know, not necessarily, well, it is relating to being open, but it's actually providing a context to how we as an industry can be more open and collaborative. This idea that we need to actually collectively work together to challenge norms. So, um, I put this up as a bit of a case in point, you know, it's, we shouldn't just be adapting technology to emulate or speed up existing processes, but actually questioning the validity of those processes in the first place, um, in terms of, you know, do they need to be sped up in their current form, i.e. bricklaying, or can we actually start to look at completely new materials and, and construction technologies as well? And this is where, um, you know, elsewhere with a focus on openness and efficiency, We've been very lucky to be part of some grassroots industry-led conversations that led to a lot of pressure being placed on Autodesk as a, as a software developer to actually help us rebuild and um, refocus the digital ecosystem that we as practices have in play. Um, and so this opens up the idea that open dialogue cannot just allow us to make better use of the technologies at our disposal, but allow us as an industry to influence the technologies that we use so that we can, uh, frankly, do better work and overcome the challenges that we are faced as a profession today. Um, and so, you know, the, these ideas that I put across as part of this talk, um, you know, around accessibility, mobility, having a clearer language, being able to explore, collaborate, and challenge ideas. We've seen success in all of these areas within Grimshaw, but I think there is definitely op the opportunity you know, within the wider industry and with academia, you know, really kind of embracing and, and helping push that forward. Um, I think that we can actually make huge strides where we need to make those huge strides today. Um, and so for me, I will wrap up there and say um, that is why I think openness is an opportunity when it comes to design technology. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Andy. Um, we can open uh, it up to questions if there are any. I mean, I certainly have a few, but maybe if anyone would like to ask any questions. Go on, Elif. What? has a question. Hi, has a question. Thank you very much for this talk. Um, I think it's very interesting, this idea of openness as an opportunity. You talk about the sort of possibilities that it does bring and the existing challenges. I'd really like to get your thoughts on what you think might, could possibly be that trigger that sort of allows openness to sort of disseminate throughout the industry itself, as opposed to maybe like as it exists right now, where a few individuals here and there yep. are trying to push this agenda? Um, I think, well, I think there's a few things that come into play there. One is that the, um, the embracing of technology is no longer kind of a niche corner of, of the industry as it once was. Um, I think we've seen a huge amount of growth when it comes to the skill sets of actually people who are coming through into the industry now coming out of academia. Um, they're now qualified and they've got this very strong technological skill set as well as the curiosity to actually see what can be done with it. Um, you know, case in point, the, the team at Grimshaw is very much, um, it's grown quite a lot over the past few years, but we've seen a lot of applicants. In fact, you know, we've got an incredibly rich selection of applicants whenever we open a position, whereas if we did that even five years ago, we'd struggle to find, um, 
you know, strong skill sets or people with that mindset and that drive to actually bring technology into industry. So that's one side is that I'm seeing change from that perspective. In terms of how we can push it more, I think there's really this idea of, and it comes back to the third point around language and communication, is we need to break down this fear of technology as, frankly, it's part of our IP. Because our, for me, technology is a tool. Technology is an addition to our existing tool set, whether you know, that consists of previously um, scale rules, drawing boards, computers, whatever. You know, the advent of computational design, of BIM, you know, going into machine learning and all of these things. These are all tools at our disposal. And so we need to actually embrace and be open about them. We're not secretive about the fact that we use computers or what computers we use. Why should we be secretive about the tools that we use? Rather, it's how we, it's how we use those and the, the outcomes and essentially what we produce. That's where our IP should lie. So we need to divorce you know, these two subjects from one another. And that's something that we need to get across into the industry leaders of today who potentially aren't as technologically savvy, but you know, are much more business focused. And so they, you know, they're the ones who raise the concerns around intellectual property, around privacy and all of these things. Um, and so it's breaking down that barrier and that understanding. Now that has to be done both in a practice level, it's something that we're pushing for within Grimshaw um, to make success, um, but also you know, across the wider industry as well. Um, and that's a much more difficult conversation. I think that's where we can look to, I'd say both, both academia, but also the institutions that govern us as an, as an industry. So REBA and ARB and all that, which have historically not been as focused on technology, but I think they, they have a voice into this as well. Thank you. Maybe I can ask you a question. Um, from a perspective of someone who is in the middle of all of these topics and trends in industry, I want to know your opinion about what needs to change in our educational system when we're educating architects to come to industry to be open to this idea of openness? Um, that's an interesting question because actually when I was putting together this presentation, the, it, I, I was actually more thinking about it the other way in actually what industry can learn from academia. The whole idea of the studio mindset of teams working together, of this sharing of ideas and this um, distribution of responsibilities, for instance, within a particular thesis project. You've got multiple people working on it, but taking on different um, pieces of work. So I think, so I've, I've completely ignored your question at that point, so I will come back to it in a moment. But I think there, there's, there's absolutely the opportunity to learn, uh, for industry to learn from academia and this, this kind of collaborative and studio mindset, um, which somehow gets kind of lost upon the way like, when people step out of university building and step through the doors of practice. Um, but then in terms of, you know, what can change within academia to aid that transition, um, I think actually there's, there's looking at the package as a whole. This idea that, you know, that there are incredibly strong programs that look at technologies and their implications into, into design. There's incredibly strong um, uh, programs that look at, at design intent. And then there's things like, you know, the professional practice and the part three courses that look at the slightly more business oriented side of things. They, for me, they kind of need to start to be blended together a little bit, even if there is still, you know, a particular focus or a particular leaning within a program. If there can at least be an understanding of, for instance, you know, as you're looking at a, a technology that is aiding a design process, put some thought into how that can be con contextualized into a practice. And I think it's something that we talked about as part of the, the MTech jury and as, as part of as conversations, is actually imagine if, that, if the work that was presented as part of um, the jury today, if that was presented in practice, actually the audience has a completely different, would have a completely different um, set of priorities. It would be less on you know, the beauty of the design or the execution and more on actually those initial principles of how is this 
enabling a better product? How is it enabling a safer product or um, better time or more efficient and those types of things? So it's starting to, yeah, contextualize the work that is happening in academia within an industry setting. And actually, I think that could be done through much stronger dialogue with industry during academia as well. Maybe just to pick up on, on that point, which is very important, I mean, we, as you know, we do value the collaborative nature between academia and, and practice, but one of the um, examples that you showed is quite uh, intriguing, where you show these several configurators, and I believe your aim was to make them talk to one another, right? And so obviously the kind of, the first thing you think about is, okay, it's, it's really about import, export, like file types. Mm. They need to, they need to uh, be, be coherent. But I guess my question is, is, is there enough willingness in the industry to make these platforms talk to each other? Or is there at least some like more attempts being done in, in that front? Um, that's a very good question. I would say that at the moment, it's something that is still very much in its nascent phase. We are kind of, for instance, on that work, we're looking to get, kind of get people signed up and embracing it with an intention that, you know, if we can start to build out enough of an ecosystem of people who are engaged and involved in it, then actually it, it will be, it's better to be part of it than outside of it. Um, now, that is, you know, very early days. It's still something that needs to be proven out. And actually, it still needs a lot of work in terms of actually the, the, the product and the framework itself. Um, but, you know, we're looking at that essentially through approaching and talking to people as much as we can. So, you know, if we need to be open, we, if we want the industry to be open, we want to be open to start with. So it's actually exposing everything we're doing and saying, look, this is what we're doing. Please, will you work with us on it? Instead of just saying it's open, actually encouraging people to be part of it. And I actually want to add, uh, I really like the slide with the DLA Pareto Front Solutions, like all that kind of specific <laughs> terminology. I mean, again, it highlights that communication is really important. So, you yep. know, it's. It's one thing to talk about these things in studio, but it's another thing to talk about them to a wider audience. Um, yeah, that was a really good point, I think. Well, I think it, it's that idea, and I think I said it today, um, talk about the task, not the tool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, thank you. I'll just carry on a little bit with that, because uh, I want to argue something slightly differently, that um, there are waves of innovation which go out. It doesn't really matter where they start, sometimes in industry or sometimes in practice or, or academia. And then things become the norm. Yeah. So I, you know, from an old person, say, I remember when BIM was an academic, yeah. um, esoteric word that nobody in practice or... Um, industry knew what it was or even had any liking for it. So that there are ways that what is today's innovation becomes tomorrow's norm and becomes kind of rather old-fashioned uh, quite quickly. And that process seems to be really accelerating. Yes. Uh, and I wonder if you see how... Uh, I also remember Grimshaw is a very small practice. <laughs> um, the number of big practices in the world seems to be shrinking. I don't know if I'm correct in, in that, and I haven't seen any analysis, but I'm beginning to think about that. that uh, okay. One of the potentials that was always put forward of uh, new, new design technologies was the ability for a smaller number of people to do bigger projects. Is yep. that still the case, or is that...? Um, I'd say that's still the dream. Um, but I would say that actually what we're starting to see more is rather than, you know, completely saying that a project that would have been delivered with 20 people is now being delivered with five people, rather it's still got 20 people working on it, 
but they're just striving towards a higher, quali a higher quality outcome. So that's, well, at least that's the phenomenon that we've seen within Grimshaw. You know, it, it, it's less about reducing the number of people and actually just being able to work the problem more and more, just leveraging technology as much as possible. Is so, there any limit to that? I, uh, we've not found it yet, but <laughs> because I, I, I think, you know, architects as a breed will never be happy with, with what they're working on. They will always find the time to work into it. Um, Nick, well, I mean, he, he was, he's actually, he did a, a quote that I really liked, which is, um, I think I'm paraphrasing at this point because I can't remember exactly, but it was, we should always be designing with the tools of the age or the tools of the time. Um, and so whilst he isn't directly involved actually with, with the practice so much anymore, he's more on the foundation side, um, whenever this work was put in front of him, say five years ago, which is when he was last properly engaged, there was almost this, actually, he had better ideas than we did on how it could be used, um, which was I always found brilliant. Um, and it's almost reminiscent of, there's another partner who has always described himself as one of the least technologically savvy within, um, within the practice. He made this point of pride that he's never drawn a line on the screen. Um, but we put him in a VR headset and gave him the controllers and said, okay, you can sketch in 3D. And he w took to it more naturally than anybody else that I've ever seen because it's the idea that it's just another tool. And, you know, I think if Nick were, were more, were still as engaged in the practice as he was now, I think he would actually be seeing these as just, you know, as Mike suggests, another wave of tools that are just able to be used. They're not seen as a gimmick. They're not seen as you know, something to be feared or hesitated over, but they're just another tool. My, my worry as a practitioner, as a father, is, oh, sorry, is that our kids may not be able to design their way out of anything if they're just landed somewhere with a piece of paper and a pencil. Because the skill sets are so, I mean, look, we, we try and employ, you know, the brightest, whizziest kids. And I think if I'd be honest, you, know, you tend to look at the skill sets and how proficient they are yeah. in the software, whereas as opposed to looking at the content of the portfolio, because it's now more and more critical, smaller practices, you know, where you kind of need to decide. Yeah. So, I mean, that's... It's, it's just an just ob observation. You know, no, 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 but, but, it's, but it, it's, it's actually a very... It's very appropriate because it's something that we're looking at at the moment. We've actually just been through this process of testing every designer within the practice for Revit and Rhino. We've rolled out assessments to everyone and they've done it all now. And on the understanding that we don't want everybody, or we wouldn't expect an, everybody to be passing with flying colors on the software. But actually, you, what is the sweet spot of, you know, when it comes to recruitment or even actually in, in, in the practice as a whole, where do you need your design skills? Where do you need your um, uh, technology skills? Where do you need your delivery skills? And what is the proportion of those, of those? So that's something that we're looking through at the moment because I think we need to embrace the fact that, you know, whilst I say technology provides this opportunity through openness, that's not saying that everybody needs to be leveraging technology. They just need to see that it has this opportunity. I mean, are we heading towards a perhaps not sort of design um, led practices like Grimshaw, but other practices who embrace their technology that they'll end up, uh, that technologists would embrace the, this side of things. Um, yeah, potentially. And which is a. Yeah, um, I mean, actually, what we're starting to see more as a bit of a phenomenon, which isn't necessarily touching the. Well, it is touching the larger practices quite a bit, but it, it's almost aiding smaller practices. Is a lot of the design technologies are starting to spin out as their own startups, where essentially they become essentially design technology as a service. So it, you no longer need to have it in-house. You can just bring in, um, you can outsource those particular tasks, those uh, pieces of work to a startup who is looking at it. And we've seen that in the past where members of our team have actually gone off and started their own um, firms looking at very 
specific topics within design technology. So it starts to be less of practice has everything, you have everything you want within your own walls, but you've got your ecosystem of services around it as well. Um, I would like to get your opinion on the client's role in this topic. Um, I know, I was wondering if you think clients would prohibit the progress of design technology since it's not quite their priority as much as cost or time, or if you think that they actually get excited about this technology and would be more willing to integrate this. Uh, is this a factor in why people aren't adopting it, or is, is this actually... So actually, for us, with with the projects that we work on, particularly larger scale ones like um, like some of the transit projects and aviation projects that we've got, it's a requirement. Clients are actually saying what they would like us to be doing. It's n you know, years ago they would mention BIM and wouldn't really know what it was. They're just like, yes, we would like a BIM, please. Now it's a case of you know they're they're very very clear on what they want when it comes to BIM. They say they want to see computational processes. They say we want. Um, a, an allowance for a VR experience. These start to become part of the briefs that we're given that we need to bid on. So clients are actually becoming much more, are becoming mature at a much faster rate than necessarily practices, which is, it's an interesting phenomenon, but it, it really kind of lends to this idea that we need to evolve at a much faster rate. Because for them, you know, you as you mentioned, their, their priority is going to be cost, it's going to be efficiency, but they need to put those pressures onto industry to deliver it. And you know they, they do their research, they know what is going to deliver it, and it is leveraging technology, so that's what they ask for. Great, thank you so much. Hi, um, thank you for the presentation. It nice. is really something which we are currently doing in the academia, so it's really helpful to see how the Current scenario is. Uh, my question to you was to do something with um, the current state, uh, how everything is getting technology driven or data driven. So, like you can say, function in a way is also being defined with the data that is generated uh, on technology. Um, so, how do you, or what is your opinion on the sort of which I feel is a gap that is getting created with um, the um, quality or the you know, intimacy of a space that a creator or a person would imagine and do, uh, whereas to something where creativity could be um, being more uh, digitally dependent mm -hmm. or you know, something like that. So what would you say on this aspect of technology versus the um, something coming out from, you know? Yeah. Um, I love that question, actually. Uh, so th this is... I think, I think for me, this is where I, this is why I love architecture. Because I think in my role, people say, why can't you go and work for a contractor? Why can't you, because you know, it's much more numbers driven or whatever, but architecture still has that element of delight. Of, you, know, you need to create spaces where people want to be, where people enjoy being, where it's good for them. Which is incredibly hard to quantify, and it's incredibly hard to digitize that. And so I quite enjoy finding this um, balance between digital and technology being able to take the process so far before actually you re need some incredibly talented design designers to actually say, okay, how do we make this an incredible space for a human being? Um, and for me, that you know, that's it's something I enjoy because I think the, the reason I, I got into this and stayed into it is because what I enjoy doing is problem solving. So I enjoy taking the painful bits of, of the design process, trying to make it as streamlined as possible so that actually designers can design. Designers can have the fun doing the fun bit and not having to do reflected ceiling plans, not having to do toilet layouts and stuff like that, unless you want to create delight in the toilet. Maybe you do. Um, but it, it's this idea that I... You know, you, you mentioned data-driven processes, and that, that is definitely a buzzword. It's a drive, going back to the question before, it's something that clients are starting to ask about, is, you know, what are you going to do with your data? You know, how can we leverage that as much as possible to gain insight? Um, because they then want to take that data and use it 
when it's in, in, in use. Um, and so we can take on that challenge and that in itself is another skill set that we as practice need to embrace is the ability to parse, analyze, understand this vast amount of data that we produce. Um, but then always allowing that space for design to still happen, for um, people to still create and not just automate everything. Thank you. Right. Great. If there is no more question, um, we would like to thank Andy all together for the great lecture. And thank you everyone uh, who joined online and here. We now have a drink reception. So please, yeah, we can continue a conversation with drinks. Um, thank you again. Thank you, Andy. Mute doesn't.